Very good evening. Welcome to the Neil Oliver Show on GB News TV, online and on radio. With me, Bev Turner tonight, standing in for Neil as he takes a very well-deserved holiday. Now, this week, privacy. Do we take it for granted and how much is it under threat? Lord Blunkett wrote an emotional piece in the Mail this week about the need for a biometric digital ID service. I'm going to be speaking to a number of experts to consider the pros and cons of such technological wizardry. I'm going to be speaking also to reality TV star Frankie Essex. What does privacy mean to a professional YouTuber? And do they have any concerns about living their lives in the permanent public space? Plus, we're going to be debating whether the Germans got it right this week to relax the rules on cannabis. But first, an update on the latest news headlines. So, am I the only person who feels that privacy is fast becoming resigned to history? Thanks to social media, not all of which is bad, by the way, we can now transmit or receive the minutiae of life's most banal, some would say private moments. Whether at home, on a beach, single or married, joyful or depressed, we can tell everyone about it at the touch of a button. For some, this is literally their job, and that's fine. That's within their control. But there are also rapidly emerging ways in which surveillance is not optional. We've had zero say in whether we consent to this minute-by-minute -minute intrusion. And this week, the march towards bi biometric digital ID, that is mandatory surveillance with potential conditions attached, moved a step closer. We're already used to seeing our faces reflected black back to us at self-service tills. Actually, I'm not. The first thing I do is stick a plastic bag over the camera. But from this week, some supermarkets will now be scanning your face with age identification AI technology if you wish to buy over 18 products. Apparently, it's going to remove altercations with law flouting youngsters. Just another way of avoiding a difficult conversation and saying no to a child. Of course, it won't stop kids buying booze. They'll just send in an older teen, except there will no longer be someone at the till looking over their shoulder, suspecting that the law might be being broken. Let's not worry about the kids. Let's just outsource that to a computer. And then there's the data harvesting and the mobile phone surveillance that reads your mind, bringing up adverts for products you seem to sometimes merely think about. We've all accepted these intrusions with zero consideration of legal or even just socially agreed, agreed rules around their existence. Privacy has fast emerged as the most significant citizen protection issue in the global information economy. Of course, every industrial revolution has changed the relationship between the private and the public. Even leaving the home to work in a factory rather than plough your own fields altered that dynamic. Then the arrival of the camera and the printing press triggered similar moral panics about the risks of misinformation or mistaken identity. But now we are literally edging towards a digital tyranny. The traditional definition of privacy was drawn up in 1891 by two American lawyers, and it was the right to be let alone or freedom from interference or intrusion. How quaint. But after World War II, in the year that George Orwell wrote 1984, the UN Declaration of Human Rights stated, no one should be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence. We were doing quite well until 2016, when the American Patriot Act used the 9-11 disaster as a valid reason some might say an excuse, to expand the government's legal rights to monitor phone and email communications to keep us all safe, of course. But this fourth industrial revolution that we are in right now, launched as the Great Reset by King Charles, inevitably poses the most serious threats to our anonymity, our privacy and our freedoms. When Labour Home Secretary David Blunkett tried to introduce ID cards to the UK in 2004, Boris Johnson said that it was a loss of liberty and that he would rather physically eat his card than present it for inspection. We were doing quite well. But of course the pandemic changed everything and in September 2020 the government announced that they were pressing ahead with a digital identity scheme so that we could securely prove who we were online to keep us all safe, of course. Also now, though, for your convenience, at a time when nothing works and nothing is convenient. Blunkett is back on the propaganda trail, announcing that a biometric digital ID system which logs your eyeballs or facial features is the only way to solve the small boat crisis. And guess who's in line for the contract? Fujitsu, as they made such a good job of the post office scandal. The small boat's move is very clever. Pick the topic that most incenses people and offer this as a handy solution. It might work.
But I can't help thinking that illegal migrants wanting to be British citizens would line up to have their eyeballs scanned and registered as legit. But it will definitely compromise the liberty of us ordinary people who will find all of our data and misdemeanours logged in a central database. Next step, conditions of freedom attached, be that carbon credits, calories consumed or parking fines unpaid. Plus, thanks to last week's Scottish Hate Crime Act, you can now add fear of being dobbed in by someone sat at your own dinner table to your paranoia list. Make sure Grandad doesn't slip up with his terminology. If he can be deemed to be stirring up hate, his words could be logged even if it isn't deemed a crime. There are now an estimated 5 million CCTV cameras in the UK alone. Are they making your life more convenient? I'd say a hard no. Are you safer because there's a camera on every corner? Well, crime and conviction figures would prove not. So who is it all for? The illusion of safety and convenience is always about hiding the ambition to control. Right, let's speak about this with Peter Aiton, Professor of Decision Research at University of Leeds. There's a lot of work into the decisions people make regarding their privacy or lack of it. Hello, Peter. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. Um, how would you characterise that our relationship with privacy has changed throughout recent years, at least? Well, the challenges have changed completely. I mean, many things that we used to do... Um, literally in a very private way with very few people knowing about them are now done in a manner which uh, is accessible to all sorts of onlookers and data gatherers. So quite mundane tasks like um, internet searches, uh, dating apps, um, you know, all of these things are, mm. you know, coming in very recent times and we haven't yet really, uh, evolved um, procedures to govern uh, not just the regulations, but our own intuitions about mm. what is reasonable to disclose, what should be kept private, in what kind of way is it private, and, and so on. I mean, there's a multitude of issues there. And it very much kind of changes as well, I think, our relationship between the individual and the state as well, to some degree, in that we are just the little people. And that actually, if we do move towards the digital ID centralized government run system, there's something very much about a paternal relationship that the state takes on under that, uh, under those roles, perhaps. And that wouldn't necessarily, in my view, be positive. Well, I mean, the technology is going to be irresistible, of course. I mean, things are going to have to be dealt with in one way or another. Mm. Um, of course, you know, we have, in theory, in a democracy, we have the ability to de develop legislation and regulation to determine exactly uh, how people should operate. Um, you know, I appreciate you can be uh, suspicious about the uh, capacity to, to do these things. The science about this is, uh, you know, that's what I know anything about, um, suggests that uh, people's understanding of um, what's at stake is very limited and their ability to make the key decisions is also very limited. So privacy and your, um, you know, rights over your information almost always is going to involve difficult trade-offs of one kind or another. Like if you want to gain access to a service, you're going to have to interact with that service in some way and provide mm. data what data should you provide what um uh, rights the uh, holder of those data have to uh, exploit them in whatever way these things are becoming very hard to summarize in a simple way for people to make straightforward judgments about in a way, so there, is a, there is a paradox uh, here because you've never had a time when companies particularly have to be more, ca more careful with our data. We've had the GDPR rules, a lot of it actually coming from, from the EU in terms of what companies can do with our information. But I think from a, a, a personal point of view, there's a more kind of pernicious effect, which is just this sense that we're being watched and how do human beings tend to react to the notion of being watched is there a negative in the longer term to literally what it is to be human 
Well, of course, you know, it can sound rather sinister and menacing. And perhaps, you know, that's something that we really ought to be very concerned about. I mean, there plainly is the potential to um, exploit data in ways that may not be to the benefit of the people providing those data. And we need protection in order to to achieve that. Um, as I say, the science on this, um, to the extent it can inform these arguments, um, really just shows how difficult it is. So, for example, um, you know, there's when you enter into a, some kind of service arrangement, I don't know, with Facebook or whoever, mm. there's all, almost always a privacy agreement, which mm. explains how the provider of the service is going to use your data. And the research shows that most people don't bother to read those privacy agreements at all. Um, you know, I put my hand up there. Mm. But also the research shows that even if they did bother to read them, they wouldn't be able to understand them. So they're, you know, mm. often they're very lengthy uh, documents written in legalistic terminology, which really doesn't leave you any the wiser about what may or may not happen with the information that you provide. And that's not coincidental, is it, Peter? Because the benefits of being able to use our data is very, very profitable for a lot of these corporations. And it's, it's predicated on the idea that we won't opt out of that relationship. Are you also seeing a time where it's impossible to even function in modern society without being embedded in some of this um, tech um, registration systems, let's say. Well, you hear about people. I was listening to um, John Cooper Clark on the radio a few weeks ago, who doesn't even have a mobile phone and has never interacted with the internet in any way. Wow. But, uh, you know, that in a way proves the point. I mean, you've got to be pretty eccentric and discrepant with uh, the modern world in order to, you know, resist the incursions completely. Mm. As I say, I mean, yeah. the Regulation and the legislation is there to be formulated, but from the scientific perspective, I mean, I worry about this as a sort of a challenge to human psychology. Like, what can people understand about what's going on uh, in a manner that enables them to be empowered to make decisions and to recognize the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 what's at stake and yeah. how to control it? I mean, it's rapidly... Um, eluding the majority of the electorate, I think, in terms of understanding. Exactly. And that is why we're having this conversation and why, that's why you have been the perfect person to talk to about it as well. Uh, thank you so much, Peter Ayton there, Professor of Decision Research at the University of Leeds. Welcome back to Neil Oliver Live with me, Bev Turner, while Neil takes a break. Now, we've been talking this evening about private lives, what it means for you. We've got Scotland's new hate crime law this week, and this subject of digital ID cropped up. Uh, Lord Blunkett was telling Keir Starmer that he must introduce biometric digital ID should have become Prime Minister to tackle small boats. Both of these pose threats to our privacy, I would say. But some people live in a world where they broadcast their life to the entire globe. One of those is reality TV star and internet personality Frankie Essex. Here she is on the show. The only way is Essex. I want to move out, but I don't want to, I just don't want to live here no more. Why though? Because I want to get my, I want a bit more of my space and like, Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, but you know I've always been about it since I was like 17, yeah, no. 18. Yeah, I know you always talk about it, but it's never happened, has it? You know, but now I'm 21, <laughs> do you know what I mean? 21, I need to move out. Now, there's a shot, inexplicably Joey Essex with no top on there, but a jacket in the kitchen, <laughs> Frankie. Um, but you, you have little twins now as well. So you've chosen this this life, this career, this job, which is about broadcasting who you are. Do you have any yeah. conflict about that in, in your own mind? Do you have any regrets or is it ever difficult to live in, in the public spotlight in the way that you do? It's not really. I think it was like, obviously, it was a big thing going into it because it was the unknown. Like, we was all just normal kids, really, from Essex. Um, but my psychiatrist, when I was younger, she said to me, the only big thing that will ever change, obviously, I lost my mum to suicide. So she said, the only thing that will ever change in me being a mum, like the biggest impact. Mm. So it didn't have much of an impact on me myself. But it, obviously, it has other people and whatnot, you know. Um, mm. But yeah, being a mum has definitely changed me. But I, uh, it was just a bonus to my life, you know, being on the show. 
And, and obviously, when you did The Only Way is Essex, you were opening up your, your life to scrutiny. Yeah. Did that come with uh, difficulties as well, or has it always been fairly plain sailing for you? No, it, it definitely did with my weight. I must say, uh, the press um, just was on me about my weight. And when I look back, I weren't even that big, mm. um, which was hard for me, um, 100%. And now I look back, I was like, oh, my God, I weren't even that big. Like, I've always thought I was bigger than I, what I really was, you know? Yeah. Um, so that definitely was a big impact. It always has been now for me. Um, and then after having the twins, there was um, a pack outside my house, and I didn't know he was there. And um, I uh, took the babies for a walk for the first time on my own. So it was like a bit of a proud moment for me. I didn't know he was there until the pictures went out the next day. And like, honestly, I didn't see him. And I was really upset because I knew the pack as well. Because you get to know them over the years, mm. you know. They're always there. But I, generally, I've moved house and everything. So I don't know how he found out where I lived. Um, but I was really upset. And I did message him because I had his number and everything. Right. Um, and just said, I think you're bang out of order. Like doing them pictures about me knowing with my newborn babies because I was on my own and I took Logan out of the pram and I was a bit nervous, I was on my own, do you know what I mean? I just thought, if he was there, I wish he would have said. Yeah, so, so in a way, even though you do curate your life on social media and on Instagram and you've got tons of followers on all of your social media, yeah. when somebody does it, when it's not on your terms, that still feels mm -hmm. like some sort of privacy violation. Oh, my God, definitely. Like, before I was even on the show, it was Joey was on the show. Um, someone told a story about our mum, and it weren't, it's not someone else's story to sell. Mm. It's our story, not, not even to sell, to say, you know. Because Joey had never talked about on the show. No one knew, the press, no one knew what happened with my mum mm. until someone told a story to the News of the World or The Sun. And it was front page. It was awful. Like my whole family had to go through it kind of again, you know? Yeah. Can you, can you ever imagine a time, Frankie, where you would step out of the public eye completely? Because I don't think... People say, oh, Instagram, is it such an easy job being an influencer? I think it's my worst nightmare, having to look good all the time, having to have your babies looking cute all the time, when life is probably I'm much sorry. more chaotic than that. You know, does it no. ever get a bit much? Do you know what? I'm not one of them people who like always look a million dollars. Like I, I generally don't say I burnt my hand about, about an hour ago on the hot tap. Mm. Um, I'm always out. Me and the babies go out. We this morning we went out with them um, to the nursery to go and get some plants. I just chucked on there while he's had the pajamas and underneath. I just chucked on a tracksuit over the top. Like I live quite a normal life. Do you know what I mean? Um, and your babies are, they're, they're still very little, aren't they, at the moment? But some people might yeah. say, well, you've not, they, they don't have a choice now about whether they are ever going to have a, a private life. And I imagine you've probably grappled with that a bit. Yeah, well, kind of. But I think, like, with Instagram and the, just social media nowadays, you've got a choice whether you want to post them or not on your social media. Mm. I'm not the only one. Thousands, millions of people post their children up, you know? Um, celebrity or not celebrity so it's just a choice me and Luke actually did make before they was even here yeah we actually spoke about it because it, it is one of them things I think it is something you speak about you know and do you think there might be a time when they might turn around to you as grumpy teenagers and say mom I never wanted to be in the public eye I never wanted all my pictures of me as a baby to be there forevermore online do you ever worry about that uh, not really, no. Obviously, if that was one of their choice, I would explain that to them. But they both love the camera. They they say cheese all the time. People are constantly taking pictures of them, like we are generally on our phones, you know, because they're yeah. like our babies and they're so cute. I think if you've got your own children, you do take pictures of them and videos and they play up to the camera. They... They and love it. The way they're twins, they just think it's amazing. And we're, we're talking a lot on this, on this show tonight about kind of the surveillance state as much as social media. So the fact that there are cameras on every street corner now. I'm going to be talking in a minute to the guy that started something called Litter Cam, which will take a picture of someone throwing litter out of the car. And then you get a ticket arrive in the post. All of that kind of surveillance that we've all just sort of had to just accept without any kind of debate. Do you think your generation, because you are so used to social media, will not have any kind of privacy concerns about that? No, really, because people are doing it for something else, aren't they? I can't think what it is now. Is it being on the phone in the car? 
people have done that and like got people fined. And if that's what the world's coming to, that's what the world's coming to. We've got in America, they've got robots delivering food, or we've got a robot vacuum. Like it's all getting very technical now. I mean, mm. if that's the way the world's going, you kind of that's the way it is. That's the way it is, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, Frankie, thank you so much for joining us and giving your unique insight uh, into your fascinating life, Frankie Essex. There. Um, I think generational issues play a massive part in this. Do you, do that generation, do you think, and younger give up their privacy? Now, eight councils around Britain have been trialling a new AI method of combating littering. The technology called LitterCam uses AI to track down litterers using CCTV camera footage, which can spot potential miscreants and track them down by registering the car's number plate. I'm joined now by Andrew Kemp, the founder and CEO of LitterCam. Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Now, you terrify me with your technology, but also there's one thing I hate more than technology. It's people throwing litter out of car windows. So you also really confuse me about where I sit on this, Andrew. How did it come around in the first place, this technology? Uh, David, it's a really, really good question. Um, I guess I was brought up in a family of individuals who really looked after the, uh, the neighborhood and instilled a sense of civic pride. My dad would pick up litter in the street after the been lawyer, been passed, a keen fisherman, and he'd come home with other people's bags of litter. Um, I was at a crossroads in terms of career change a number of years ago and saw that the government had issued the litter strategy for England in effectively giving powers to local authorities across England to use technology that didn't yet exist. I saw an opportunity, and mm. here we are. And have you had to jump through all sorts of legal hoops to spy on people, Andrew? Because that is what you're doing. Uh, I wouldn't say we're spying on people. So oh, our are. customer, uh, oh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good comment, Beth. Um, so our, our customers are local authorities. The way that technology is being designed, which is software, is to analyze existing CCTV cameras if they're out there doing hotspots or if they've got problem litter areas where there's no coverage, we can provide new equipment at those locations. So we're not a CCTV uh, camera supplier per se. Um, if a local authority does wish to install CCTV cameras, there's a specific process that they have to follow. It's uh, part of the home office. It's called the surveillance camera code of practice. So they have to, uh, basically produce a, an impact assessment to do with data privacy. So there's there's absolute sort of safeguards in place there. But you could, I guess, catch someone, snogging someone in the back of their car that doesn't want to be there and you might out them. You will have that footage. I'm just using a trite example of what people might do in their cars that they may not want you to be watching. What happens to that footage, Andrew? So it's not our footage. So again, it's uh, local authorities that have, have got the footage and um, the software is designed just to detect the action of littering from, from a vehicle. Right. So there may be a, a 10, 20, 30 second clip that spans a littering offence and the, the, ve the, the number plate. Um, so the system doesn't capture uh, footage on, a, on an ongoing basis and store that. And then you collaborate with the DVLA and the owner of that car gets a ticket through the post. Is it proving successful? We're at quite an early stage, really. So the DVLA have only uh, recently opened up their systems to be used for the offence of littering from vehicles. Right. Um, uh, so it's a, a fairly new development. I think also the background of uh, local government finance uh, is, is proving challenging for them. So we've come up with some innovative financial models that enables you, them to use our technology on a, right. on a sort of attractive and accessible basis, really. OK, stay where you are. I'm joined by Mark Johnson as well here in the studio, advocacy manager for uh, Big Brother Watch. Listening to that, uh, Mark, um, what are you thinking from your personal expertise point when you see this new phenomenon of litter cam? Well, I, I think the thing that worries me the most is kind of like the mission creep. I mean, when we first introduced CCTV to society, you know, it was done under, under the justification of, you know, trying to uh, find evidence or, or look at very serious crime that was taking place. And I think 
this will unnerve people because it's the kind of level of intrusion into their lives to such a you know low level degree um, that you could reasonably say, is the surveillance warranted? Is it justified? Is it proportionate? Which is a really mm -hmm. crucial question we should always apply to these kind of scenarios. And I think people will find it slightly creepy and invasive, you know, with all due mm -hmm. respect to Andrew. Andrew, do you have to have signs up saying, we are watching you, don't empty your ashtray out of your window? <laughs> um, maybe those words could be chosen by a local authority. Um, that work. <laughs> <laughs> so local authority so there's going back to the surveillance camera code of practice they talk about having signage also the defra code of practice as well talks about uh, publication campaigns so it that can be interpreted by them as signage it could be detail on their websites they might have social media posts so it it shouldn't be viewed as a as a as a way of sneakily um, trying to catch out the public for people who choose to litter. I mean, it definitely is sneakily trying to catch out the public if they try to litter. Do you have similar concerns, Mark, that, that we would have about a creeping surveillance state? I'm guessing probably not. I mean, like I say, on yours, I'm quite torn because I hate littering. So I am, I am a little bit conflicted about it. But I think the mission creep that Mark talked about is real. Sorry, Bev, is that a question to me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Carry on, Andrew. Yeah. I was saying, do you have um, any, do you have similar concerns about the way that technology and particularly surveillance is intruding in all of our lives in all sorts of ways? Um, so surveillance could be viewed as intruding into, into people's lives, but I think also they, they would have a, a, a responsibility to, to put sort of safeguards in place. If you take a, a parent as an, as an example, mm. they're probably educated children on the, on the safe use of technology um, and what to post online. It's just been featured on your show earlier on this afternoon in terms of um, mem members of parliament exchanging information that they shouldn't have done. Yeah, um, very timely. Uh, absolutely. So I think the same arguments apply, really. Mark, um, it's interesting that the idea that we as parents might educate our kids about what they share online, I think those are two very different issues. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I think that's slightly separate. I mean, just to pick up on a point that um, Andrew made about this, you know, I, I think one of my big concerns here um, is the, the kind of extent to which we are now surveilling uh, the population here in the UK. There is nothing necessarily wrong with surveillance where it is targeted, it is proportionate, where there's something, somebody that you suspect has done some wrongdoing and you target the surveillance at them. But what I'm worried about, and I think people generally are concerned about, is this idea that the surveillance should be population wide. It's not targeted. You know, we're just looking at innocent people just in case they might do something wrong. But mm. it is not specific to looking at criminals. It's actually just population wide. Andrew spoke about the surveillance camera code. Um, that is entirely voluntary. So um, people who operate surveillance cameras can abide by it. They should abide by it. But actually, there's nothing legally binding that makes them um, abide really? by it. Nothing yeah. legally binding. No. Um, obviously, those who operate CCTV cameras will have kind of data protection obligations. But when it comes to the surveillance camera code, it's a voluntary code. And what's really interesting, I think, is there is something of an explosion of surveillance in this country, of CCTV and other forms of surveillance. You know, we did a large piece of work looking at the extent to which there are Chinese state companies operating surveillance systems in the UK, like Hike mm -hmm. Vision, Dower. This is a massively underregulated space, and all we're seeing is more and more cameras and more more and more people being watched. Andrew, so Mark would say there that really you should only be watching people if you know they're under suspicion for something already. Um, I'm guessing that you might say, well, that's why the cameras are in specific litter hotspots. Is that right? Is that how you get around that? In, in part. So um, we can analyse the streams from existing local, local authority CCTV, CCTV estates. So there's no additional equipment there. So there would be no, no further intrusion um, or proliferation of, of technology. But absolutely, as, as, as you heard, if there are littering hotspots, we can put equipment in those locations um, to get uh, the action of littering from vehicles. Mm. If, if the problem then subsides, the local authority can relocate that, that equipment or, or, or use the equipment for other, mm. other reasons. It's, it's for the same the same type of purpose and approach that they um, target and approach fly tipping.
OK, interesting. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew Kemp, there, the founder and CEO of uh, Littercamp and Mark Johnson, advocacy manager for Big Brother. Watch. I think you're going to stay with me, aren't you, Mark? OK, brilliant. So new laws in Germany came into force this week, which legalised personal possession of cannabis. Since the 1st of April, adults are allowed to carry up to 25 grams of dried cannabis on them and cultivate up to three marijuana plants at home. So should Britain follow suit? To discuss that, I'm joined by Professor Mike Barnes, a consultant neurologist and Mail on Sunday columnist uh, Peter Hitchens. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. Peter, let me start with you here in the studio. Uh, this is Germany seeing sense maybe over something which is effectively decriminalised most places anyway now. Well, it isn't everywhere and I don't see why it's sense. Uh, if this were if this were Germany saying, right, let's abandon all attempts of the past 70 years to get rid of cigarettes and tobacco, everyone would think they were mad. Uh, sim similarly, a country which now proposes to legalise a drug which is increasingly correlated uh, with severe incurable mental illness and to some extent also increasingly correlated with violent crime doesn't seem to me to be sense at all. It seems to me to be sheer craziness. The arguments for it are extraordinarily weak. And the, the, the alleged good that it will do, we know from practical experience, it will not do. The advocates of this sort of legalisation always claim that it will in some way enable them to c control the market, to regulate, uh, to decide the levels of dose and to make huge amounts of money out of tax. Mm. But several jurisdictions have already tried this. Colorado and California, notably in the United States, and the whole of Canada. And the result has been that the illegal market has continued to flourish alongside the legal one. I think the latest figures show 33%. Right. Uh, this is government, Canadian government figures. 33% mm. of the trade is still in illicit hands, uh, which is, of course, completely unregulated and untaxed and therefore also sells at lower prices. It's a nonsense. And people really are going to have to learn quite soon that if we go down this road, once you've legalised a drug, Mm. And once it then goes into mass use, it's almost impossible to undo the mistake. Professor Mike Barnes, then, what might Germany's logic be to taking this action over cannabis? Well, I think the, the, the logic is, is overwhelming, really, and, and Peter will not be surprised to know that I fundamentally disagree with him. Um, first of all, you can uh, make the, the, the cannabis safer, safer than it is at the moment. Uh, you you will get rid of impurities to start with. You'll make sure that it's a safe drug to take in safe places. Uh, you will reduce uh, the amount of uh, mental illness as associated with it, and there is some. I don't disagree with that at all. Uh, but you'll be able to control that by controlling the level of THC. Uh, and, the, and the risk of mental illness, I have to say, is very small indeed. If we look at the a study in the UK called Drug Science, has been looking at now nearly 5,000 people with medically prescribed cannabis, uh, there has been not one case, not one case of, of psycho psychopathy in those people. A recent study that showed you have to stop 10,000 men and 29,000 women from smoking cannabis to prevent one episode of psychosis. So yes, it's a risk, but with proper control, it's a very, very small risk. And I have to fundamentally with Peter to say that it, it does not cause um, violence. There is absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, Peter, it's a very convincing um, case that Mike Barnes puts forward there. Um, but we know we've got a mental health epidemic, particularly in this country with teens at the moment. Does anybody really know how much of that is being exacerbated by social cannabis use? Well, nobody knows because the research isn't done. Uh, it's not done by the state. It's not done by the universities. There's, there's nobody in this country with any interest in doing research. All the big money is on the side of legalisation. There's enormous amounts of money to be made uh, in the legalisation of this drug. And a huge campaign is underway at the moment also internationally to, to get rid of the, the treaties, the United Nations treaties dating back to the 1930s, which actually make it illegal in the first place. And once they can do that, then the, the, then the whole of the United States, for instance, and this country, which, is, which are members of the United Nations Security Council, uh, could actually legalise openly. But they, they, they can't do it at the moment. And the reason for this relentless campaign is because of the billions that can be made out of it. This is the next big tobacco. And I, I have to challenge some things which, which, which Mike Barnes has just said. Uh, the evidence uh, of, of, the, uh, of the dangers of marijuana 
first of all comes from the, the, the fact that it's used very widely, particularly in schools at the moment. I'm, I know of one case, and I, I direct everybody who's complacent about this to the extraordinary book by, by, by Patrick uh, by, by Patrick Coburn and his son Henry, called Henry's Demons. Henry attended a very nice Canterbury Grammar School in the Garden of England in Kent, and at the age of 11 was introduced to marijuana, and very regrettably he became severely mentally ill as a result. And I don't think there's really very much question in anybody's mind who was involved. Well, 11 well, is young. It, well, it's, it is young, you're right, but that is where an awful lot of the current market is. In, in, in schools at the ages as low as 11. The other thing is what is generally true about legalization or decriminalization, decriminalization of the drug is it doesn't hugely increase the number of people who take it. But what it does do is it increases the number of people who take it regularly and the amount that they take. And I think there's a lot of complacency about this. I did some research a few years ago for my book on the subject about the, the complacent rubbish which was emitted by big tobacco about the, the, the dangers of lung cancer from that in the 1950s and early, and early 60s. And the same sort of bilge, I'm afraid, was talked about how there's really nothing to worry about. On the issue of violence, what I will say is that, the, again, there's no study. I've, I've often tried to get the police to tell me about the, whether there's any evidence of drug use of violent criminals, and they won't even talk about mm. it because the police themselves have given up enforcing the law. There is one very closely studied subset of violent crime, that is mass killings, either by t uh, terrorists in Europe or school shootings in the United States, almost invariably. The culprit is a long-term user of marijuana. Mike, just respond to that, please. Mike Barnes. Yeah, well, you know, I think, Pete, unfortunately, um, it collapses together the people with already existing mental illness who go around with mass killings and such like. One can't doubt that. And they happen to have cannabis. There's no direct link. There is no full stop direct link between cannabis and violence. I'm not going to say people who are violent or mentally ill don't take cannabis. Of course, some do. Some drink alcohol. Some take cornflakes in the morning. But there's not a direct link between cannabis and and violence. I have to. Also, I should no, say. Can I say. I have to treat. I have to treat Mike Barnes as a serious person. When he says nobody, nobody gets uh, nobody gets mental illness or or indulges in violent no, no, crime I'm... as a result of eating cornflakes, he's not being a serious person. We know perfectly well. You know perfectly well. You're well well equipped to, to know it. That that marijuana is a major psychotropic drug with huge effects on the human brain, and cornflakes are not. It's a silly thing to say. And it demeans you to say it. You also know perfectly well that the reason why there's so little evidence is because there's so little study. And I, as I said just now and made it perfectly clear, there is so little study because who has any in interest in there being such a study? There is a huge industry hoping to make enormous amounts of money. The last thing it needs is lots of definitive studies linking marijuana with, with lifelong incurable mental illness and other studies linking it with violent crime. Go to the website Attacker Smoke Cannabis and see just how many crimes are reported in the local newspapers of this country week after week after week in which the violent person is a long-term user of marijuana and tell go me there's no connection. Go on, Mike. Respond to Peter. Yeah. I'm really sorry to, to make the point. There is no direct connection between cannabis and violence. I'm not saying people who are violent have not taken cannabis. I'm not saying cannabis. I'm not complacent about it at all. There is mental health issues with long-term cannabis use, but properly controlled, that risk is small. It's very small. And honestly, I don't know of any industry that's run better by criminals. Why, if, if there is those issues there, and there are those issues there, I think they're overinflated, but there are those issues there. For heaven's sake, let's run it properly. Let's regulate it properly. Uh, if there's a tax income to be had, let the government have that tax income rather than the criminal fraternity. If there's jobs to be had, as about 100,000 jobs in the UK, let the proper economic market have those jobs rather than the criminal fraternity. So I think, yes, there are risks to it. I'm not being complacent at all, uh, but those risks are minimal, and I think it's better to control and contain those risks by making it legal. And One therefore, would... people use it for what, Mike? And what would people use cannabis for then, even if it was legalised? Well, I, 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 I do want to make quickly, if I may, is uh, actually, it may surprise people that I'm not in favour of immediate legalisation of cannabis because we've got to get the medical market right first. And I was a helpful part of getting the, the medical law changed back in 2018. And now there's 37,000 people prescribed medical cannabis with a great deal of benefit for chronic pain, chronic anxiety, and of course the young children with epilepsy. But we haven't got that right yet. 
There's about 1.8 million medical users of cannabis in this country, and we've got 37,000 prescribed. So we've got a long way to go before we get the medical side right. Mm. And that's what I want to do before okay. we get the, the uh, legal market. So, Peter, would you be in favour of getting the medical market for cannabis in, a, in better shape and more readily available? I think it's wholly irrelevant. Uh, it may be that marijuana uh, can be used as a medicine. I think the, the, the jury is ultimately out on it. Mm. I know some, the Home, Office has, right. been, the home Office has been very good about, about letting experiments take place. And indeed, is, the, 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 there are a couple of, of THC-based medicines available under certain strict prescription in, in this country. Whether they work or not, I don't know. I do know that the principal uh, campaigner for for cannabis legalization in the United States, Keith Stroop of Normal, said in 1979, we will use medical marijuana as a red herring to give pot a good name. And I think that's fundamentally what the medical marijuana, uh, the medical ma marijuana issue is about. We should stick to the issue of whether it should be legalized for recreational use, which is what is really a question, in question here. And when Mike Barnes says, why not let the government get taxes? Why not put it in the hands of business? Uh, what legalized marijuana means is big marijuana. It means a lot more of it. It means advertising. Uh, mm. The Proposition 64, which was the, the, the model for marijuana legalization in, in California and the United States, was specific about demanding the freedom to advertise. Remember how many years it took uh, to, to, to prevent big tobacco from advertising in this country. What you're basically proposing is the creation of a new big tobacco uh, with a very, very dangerous drug on widespread sale by big organizations, with the government becoming committed to its continued sale because mm. of its tax revenue. Uh, basically, a, a deeply immoral plan because of the huge known dangers of this drug and other dangers which will certainly become known mm. if you are successful. OK, well, thank you, gentlemen. Mike Barnes, who's giving pot a good name, as Peter said, and trying very hard with the medicinal community at the very least. And Peter mm -hmm. Hitchens, who clearly very much disagrees. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Welcome to the second hour of Neil Oliver's show on GB News Online with me, Bev Turner. Coming up in this hour, Lord Blunkett wants digital ID cards, but would there be an unnecessary invasion of our privacy? Yes, we're going to be debating that shortly. Uh, Cabinet Minister Estimate Vey this week promises us that the new pandemic treaty with the World Health Organization will not involve us handing over all of our powers to unelected officials. Is that likely to be the case? wait and see. And I'm going to speak to a mother, an extraordinary story. She's been in a three-year court battle to stop the state giving her adult son, who has very complex medical needs, the COVID vaccine. That's all to come. Right, let's get stuck into ID cards. They're back on the agenda this week after former Labour Home Secretary Lord Blunkett said that Sir Keir Starmer should introduce them if the party wins the next election. Blunkett thinks that the scheme would be a good way of tackling the small boats crisis. Funny that, the French government has claimed on numerous occasions that migrants are tempted to try and cross the channel by a lack of control over the labour market in the UK, which would be partially rectified, they say, if we had an ID system. Well, Mark Johnson from Big Brother Watch is back with me to discuss this. I'm also joined by former Labour Minister Dennis McShane. Um, Mark, I'm saying ID cards. It's not, it's not a card. A card is a very outdated concept. What do you understand that a biometric digital ID would mean in 2024? This would likely be something that would be perhaps on your phone or on another electronic device and obviously this would be slightly different from you know what we've come to know as an ID card. It would be um, more of a kind of digital conception of this idea but obviously in the same way as before tied to a kind of national or state database um, as technology moves on, it's likely that the amount of information there would include, you know, biometrics, as you say, um, and that is quite, you know, invasive, highly personal, sensitive information, which could include things like face prints, you know, fingerprints or so on. So there could be a huge amount of information all tied into one place, and uh, that's, you know, the nub of, of, of my, that's where my concerns start. All under the auspices of convenience, Dennis. Wouldn't it be convenient to have your eyeballs recorded on a data set owned by the government so they could know what you were doing and give you permission to do some things, admittedly, but then also maybe take away that permission? Gosh, well, it depends how late at night and how much I drunk before I think my eyeballs would be of any real interest. <laughs> but look, we've got all of that already. 
And this has got my health records, my bank accounts, my credit cards, my journey times, every trip I made, since it's quite an old iPhone, in the last X years. It's all available for everybody. This is such an artificial kind of fear. I mean, I've my problem is I spent 15 years living in Switzerland, probably the freest, most democratic country in the world. And I was there at a meeting in January between Swiss and British MPs, including our own beloved Liz Truss, mm. who said, oh, we don't want any of this. This is, this is, we don't want the European Court of Justice. And the Swiss said, what are you talking about? We have twice as many immigrants per capita as you do. We insist they all have to learn French, German or, or um, mm. Italian. They can, can do that uh, without a digital ID. Of course they can. They can go and get a job. But if they want then to get that job, to get accommodation, to get access to health care, we want to know who's in the country. We're the only country in Europe that has the faintest idea, literally, where immigrants are. Rishi Sunak bought in 654,000 from, well, from Pakistan, India, Nigeria last year. We don't know where any of them are. Well, we will do if they're here as legal citizens. Like you say, you will have perhaps electoral role information or at least d d uh, driving license Oh, so you do want to keep records. I thought... Oh, well, no, I'm well, happy. Well, I'm, well, we, well. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with the level of records that we have. But I think Dennis is failing to use his imagination here, Mark, as to where this might go. I mean, I think the point that you make, Dennis, is that, you know, there are, it, various databases exist, fine, we, we know that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should tie them all in together in one place where the state, you know, can control it and have all of this information at their fingertips all of the time. You, um, well, you, honestly, I mean, you want to give all this to, to, to Bill Gates or whoever in America. They've got all this on here. They've got you over there, I about, think I putting it under democratic control is better. And it's a broader idea, this, because we're jumping from ID cards sure. to, uh, to, I think, it was an idea put up on enough by William Haig and Tony, Tony Blair, Blair yeah. um, uh, two or three months ago. It seemed to have sunk slightly without trace. They keep they, trying they, and well, trying. Well, simply, they're saying, can't we use... Why are we, why are we allowing... AI and all the new technology to be used just to make people rich. Why can't we make them servants of the community? And one of the biggest problems everywhere we go in Britain is this fear particularly mm. of arrivals of immigrants. Now that I just know from Swiss and mm. other European countries. It's, it's not a magic cure, but my God, when people know that somebody knows who's in the country, they're a bit, bit less on, hostile than Why we would are. It's... I, I think look, let's be you know, very clear and precise about what we're talking about here. It is important to be able to like, verify your identity in certain circumstances. You know, there are, you know, you need to do that when you access various different services here in the UK. The most important thing, though, is I think if we introduce any kind of ID card, digital ID, it should be optional. It should serve us. It should not serve the state. It should be there to assist us in accessing sections of society. Not, you know, as, as this debate is being framed as a way to monitor people, because ultimately that is... What is proposed here? Well, well, the suggestion yeah, yeah, yeah. is that we use it to monitor everybody so that we might find no, some people whose immigration uh, no, status no, is that's, not No, that's absolutely the wrong way round. Okay. We're using it so that people know when somebody pitches up for work, they've had to show something. I mean, here's a British identity card that was issued to me in the brief period in mm. 2010 when they were issued. Now, every other citizen of Europe's got something like this. So when you go to get a job in Germany or Sw Switzerland or Norway, you have to show something like this. But that is and so that... different, Dennis, uh? to having your biometrics, your fingerprint, your facial recognition, your eyeballs scanned and logged on a system to which conditions can then be attached. I just so it might be that well, you, you made the joke about whether you've drunk too much and your eyeballs scared. It might be that you've bought too much alcohol that month and then you go to pay with your card and you won't be allowed your extra bottle of wine that oh, week well, because actually, you've had too much. Do you see where it yes, could lead? Yes, that actually is quite interesting. Imagine having something like that that you could actually know how much sugar and candy your children, in my case grandchildren, are consuming to the detriment of their teeth and health. Because really, we're getting into this now with this big debate on whether all mobile phones should be banned for children uh, at school mm. and indeed at home. I mean, Bill Gates and all the people who run Apple don't let their kids anywhere near mobile phones. That's right, but then you're talking about taking away the element of autonomy completely, so that, that yes. parenting role, you know, and then, then therein lies a complete lack of individual choice, Mark. That, that, that is... 
the, the kind of core of this debate, I think. It's about whether, you know, if we bring in some kind of system like this, if we, you know, we are moving towards digital art, you know, identification systems, verification, you know, for accessing services. From our perspective, we think you should be able to opt out of that. We think that if you want to access a service, you should be able to do it, you know, offline. You should be able to show a kind of, mm. you know, offline document as you would... Like you know, the old-fashioned plastic cards. Indeed. And there is something slightly more nefarious about the idea of a digital ID because of the kind of... The, the, the nature of the information that's stored, the, the way in which you know, things would be collated and you know, put in a giant database. It's, it's something that could then be... So, Mark, can I ask, I mean, were you at the time, I mean, or your organisation, were you in favour of these? Because I remember the Liberal Democrats, the BNP, the UKIP, the yeah. Guardian, uh, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail, mm. the right and the left united to say, this is the Gestapo arriving in Britain. Now, come on, let's and be, be enough, real. And funnily enough, I think you, I've, um, I've interviewed people from all sorts of political persuasions on my, my usual show on GB News, and actually, politically, this crosses, the resistance to this crosses all political parties. Is it a right-left issue? No, not at all. I mean, well, it, 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 as you say, it completely spans the political spectrum, and Big Brother Watch was uh, formed in 2009, so it was slightly after the debate, but you know, the, we, we, we would be against if we were around, uh, you know, when, when the idea so was So you're against me, this being issued to me in 2010. Thanks a lot. I used it to travel in Europe briefly. We have 111 countries that can send anybody to Britain visa-free without the slightest check, from Latin America in particular, all over the world, 111, and they come as tourists and they fan out and disappear and they're taking jobs you, you illegally. To, if you, if and you then if you don't have any, if you don't not, require, if you do, of course it's true. If you want to access services in the UK, you already have to prove your identity. We it, don't need a centralised system in order to do that. They're getting jobs, they're young people on the whole, they're the not... HMRC. You they're know, not, there are loads of checks in the system to find we, people already. We, Why do we need a centralised system? Well, well hang on a second then. We're, we're not contradicting. If you're saying, some people say, oh, they have to have NI numbers, yeah. they do. That is a centralised Big but Brother control tie system. In all of the other databases in one place. All that's right, OK. That's well, you have one man in one office saying, I'll do NI. And it's listing, important. And I'll do NHS. Separate, it so doesn't, the state won't monitor all of us all the, state the time. Isn't Who's your least favourite politician in the world, Dennis? My, uh, Vladimir yeah. Putin. Right. So imagine Vladimir Putin is Prime Minister in this country. I realise that's a stretch, but I'm thinking if well, somebody might come we've in... Had one but or two, you know. If he was Prime Minister and he would therefore have access to control you via your biometric digital ID, because Vladimir Putin would know where you are going, where you are shopping, what you are doing... That's how I think we have to consider well, you, but I, this. You've given all this to the private sector. They, I mean, I get such rubbish coming in on this because the private sector takes my data and sells it to people trying to flog me cryptocurrency and porn and all sorts of garbage. But crucially, there's and, a consent element there, isn't there? There's not a consent. Well, you know, wait a minute. Are you seriously saying I've got to throw this away to be free? I can't live without this. You can't live without an NI number. And I just think we should have a calmer discussion rather than starting. Uh, oh, I think uh, the time for calm is well gone because right. nobody has been discussing this. This well, is because the it's not been. We haven't trialled it. We did trial it with this but little it, fella, it, it, and, Infosys. and Theresa May came in doing what BMP wanted, UKIP wanted, the Daily Mail and wanted, all of the civil and so on. These organisations. Oh, as well. fine, and they're wrong too because I've lived uh -huh. in countries, frankly, where there's yeah. far more respect for civil liberties, like Switzerland, like in the Nordic countries, work there, and their view is if you want, if you don't know who's in the country, country, you can't deliver freedom and civil liberties. Rishi Sunak's personal family run Infosys, which run the biggest digital ID system in India and in the world. And of course, who's got the contracts here at the moment? Fujitsu, who did a brilliant job with the post office to roll this out. There's not been enough conversation, Mark, about it. No, there hasn't. I mean, I, I think this goes to the kind of the heart of this debate is about what kind of society and what kind of country you want to live in. To my mind, you know, we are exceptional. But, you know, just because other countries have gone down a certain path doesn't mean we should follow them. I like the fact that in Britain, the way that the state works is that we devolve our power up to the state and we are not given a licence to exist by the state because ultimately that is what your card is. It's a, a licence to exist where all of these services are all placed in, in one database and uh, I think it's not necessary. It's a, a, a problem that, you know, it's an issue that constantly rears its head 
and it's often justified on various different grounds, this time being immigration. But it's previously used, you know, on the grounds of fighting terrorism. I mean, what kind of effect it would have had in fighting terrorism, I have no idea. Um, but it's a problem that keeps well, coming Mark, up and it's rejected every single well, time. Well, I mean, if, if I spent a long time in politics standing for Parliament and the problem of immigration 20 years ago, mm. 30 years ago, on phone-ins, in the street, in the pubs, sure. and the biggest one is... You've lost control of the frontiers. Well, I want right. to see control so this, put back. This, this is not going to make any difference. And in, in some way, you know, it might be that Im immigrants come over and they say, yes, scan my eyeball. I want to be part of this country. Make me legitimate. Thank you, gentlemen, for a brilliant debate. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show with me, Bev Turner, this evening. So, Cabinet Minister Estimate Faye wrote a powerful piece in the Daily Telegraph this week in which she discussed the pandemic accord, which the government is currently negotiating with other countries at the World Health Organization, so that the planet can respond more effectively to any future medical emergencies. Uh, McVeigh says that the government is alive to concerns that the WHO could acquire powers which would allow them to force countries to adopt certain restrictions. And she says that they would ensure that the UK will always have the final say over how we care for our citizens. I'm joined now by Molly Kingsley, executive founder of the campaign group for Children's Welfare, Us for Them. Hi, Molly. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and breaking up your holiday uh, to talk about this, because it is incredibly important, isn't it? And there is very little in the press about what is going on. So just to explain it for our viewers who may not be aware of these health regulation amendments. Yeah, of course. And you're right. There's been far too little public discussion about something that has the power, really, to set our health, economic and, to a degree, social policy for generations to come. So these are amendments proposed by member states to the World Health Organization. There are actually two different agreements and apologies to viewers because it is a bit technical, but it is one of these areas where the technicalities are quite important because the two agreements are, first of all, a pandemic treaty and, second of all, amendments to an existing health framework called the International Health Regulations. And between them, what these two sets of agreements do is give the WHO, acting mainly through its di Director General, huge powers to set um, health policy and, in particular, pandemic preparedness policy for years to come. And those powers extend to areas of you know, public spending commitment, um, vaccine, IP development. They extend to giving the WHO powers to impose quarantines, to impose restrictions on personal liberties. That, you know, there's, there's obviously been a lot of chatter about that on social media. Mm. Um, they, as currently drafted, and this is really, really important, as currently drafted, the international health regulations, the amendments to those documents would give the WHO and its Director General power to infringe on national rulemaking autonomy. Um, and that is the area of the agreements that there has been this significant controversy about. And you're right, Bev, that last week, Esther McVeigh wrote a piece in The Telegraph in which she said, you know, look, we would never allow that to happen. It's OK, guys. Nothing to see here. <laughs> And do you believe her? I like to think that Esther McVeigh is a very well-intentioned person, um, often of this parish of GB News, of course. Um, do you think she's being perhaps maybe a little bit too optimistic or possibly naive? Yeah, I think there is a tremendous amount of naivety about what is going on here. And the reason for that, I think, is because there are these two totally separate agreements. So on the one hand, you have the pandemic treaty. On the other, as I said, you have the amendments to the international health regulations. And the most offensive provisions, and certainly the provisions which people are getting very exercised by, are all in the amendments to the international health regulations. Now, it's very hard to know what that, that set of documents is going to say, because rather unbelievably, the last set of amendments that was made available was over a year ago. So that, that document was made available last in February 2023. As for them, you know, we have a legal background. Two of us are, are lawyers. We went through those amendments. We wrote a very detailed briefing note. It's still on our website. And, you know, I can tell you that <laughs> that was a scary document. It mm. did give the W. WHO, these very wide powers. Now, Gabrielsus has, sorry, sorry, Bev, you're going to say something. No, I was just, I was just going mm. to say that some people might say, well, look, 
Bev and Molly, you're both mad. If there is another virus which spreads around the world and we all have to lock into our houses, we're going to need one global boss at the head of that decision-making process. And maybe that's what the World Health Organization should do. No, I mean, that's insane, isn't it? <laughs> Giving one person so much power over so many, you know, billions of people. And I think it, it's very interesting what Esther said to go back to that point, because she mm. came out very strongly and said, we're not, you know, her, her, what she actually said, the quote was, her, our red lines include not agreeing to anything that would cede sovereignty to the World Health Organization. Now, that is exactly what these last published amendments do. Now, Tedros Gebreyesus, who's the head of the WHO, has since come out repeatedly, actually, mm. and said, you know, anyone raising doubts about this, anyone suggesting that we're going to take sovereignty away from countries is guilty of spreading lies and conspiracy theories. What is very interesting about his very stern denials is that he is always very, very sure to focus those denials on the pandemic treaty. Mm. Now, he is right that this pandemic treaty is not on its face that offensive. However, the really problematic provisions are contained in this other document. And at no point has he taken any of his many media opportunities to, to rebut concerns of the public about that document. And you know, as for Esther, I totally agree. You know, we've worked with Esther a lot in the past before she was a minister. I think Esther is fantastic. It is really hard to know whether the government are being naive, you know, whether whether actually they it, there is a possibility that they have negotiated a very different position on these documents to that last seen by the British public and parliamentarians. And yeah. actually that the issues we are concerned about are no longer issues. If that is the case though, they they absolutely have to make these documents available to the public and available yeah. to parliamentarians. Who, Molly, who's undertaking these negotiations on our behalf? Mm -hmm. Well, this in itself is a really interesting question. We do not know is the answer. So us for them submitted a Freedom of Information Act request, gosh, probably about six months ago now, asking that very, very question. We were refused. We appealed it. We were refused, refused the appeal. The reason that they, the information isn't released is because we were told that government are concerned that were the information in the public domain, it would threaten um, the security and the safety of the individuals concerned, which is just incredible because when when you compare it, of course, to the Brexit negotiations, and you know, yeah. in in many respects, I I honestly believe that this agreement has the potential to shape our inter international relationships and our own health policy in a way that is, you know, fundamental and in some ways equivalent to something like Brexit. Mm. But when you compare it to the degree of transparency and public scrutiny there was over those negotiations, it's astounding. There's just nothing. We are all absolutely in the dark. We're in the Gosh. dark as to the substance, the identity of the people negotiating, and even the timing. You know, in theory, these agreements are going to be voted on by the World Health Assembly in May 24. And for the IHR amendments, Parliament and the public will not necessarily get a chance to even see, let alone vote on the amendments. Yet how can this be the case? Well, Why are they not in the public domain? It's a very good question, Molly, and we would always welcome anybody that wants to come on to GB News to discuss with us what is going on behind the scenes because we're talking about privacy on this show and transparency and sometimes it feels like it applies to some people and not to others. Uh, Molly Kingsley there from Us For Them. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show with me, Bev Turner, today. Now, a mother whose identity we have to protect and who I will be calling Sarah has been involved in a three-year protracted court battle because she didn't want her son, who's 24, and has complex medical needs to be given the COVID vaccine. The issue is being decided in the court of protection and at stake is the very complex matter of whether Sarah's son should be given the injection for the greater good, despite the fact that it could pose a risk to his own health. I'm delighted to be joined now by Sarah, not her real name, as I already mentioned. And when I say delighted, Sarah, I'm, I'm delighted that your story is finally getting um, some publicity, but I'm heartbroken for the situation that you find yourself in. Um, as I say, Tom is 24, but he has a mental age of a, of a toddler, I believe, because of his complex medical needs. Just outline a little bit for us, if you don't mind, who he is. 
Yes, hi Bev. Um, uh, well, Tom was born with uh, um, a genetic condition, um, partial trisomy 13. Uh, this caused a heart condition and um, also severe learning difficulties. And um, he has no speech either. Mm. And uh, sorry to interrupt, but and Tom has a heart condition as a result of his genetic problems. He does. Yeah. He does. He has tetralogy of fallow. Yeah. Um, which was a full repair when he was one. He went, um, when he was one year old, he had five hour surgery mm. and it was a full mm. repair. He doesn't take any medications for his heart or anything else. Um, so. And so you decided, you thought on the balance of risk versus benefit, I'm not going to give Tom this particular drug on this occasion, even though he'd had all other vaccines before, hadn't he? Everything else that was recommended by the doctors up until that point. And, and then what yes. happened? And then, then you were visited by um, who? Um, social services uh, wanted to pay a visit. Uh, the doctors put all his checks in place suddenly and then his heart check up and, and then a physio came. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, um, so at the end of the social worker's visit, she said, um, oh, I believe Tom hasn't had the COVID vaccination. And I said, yes, that's right. Um, I'd never been asked about his vaccination status ever with mm. social services before that. And then they sent a physio in. And at the end of that, again, he asked me the same question. And I said, I've never been asked by physio about his vaccine status. I said, so I find this... it very unusual, you know. And, and he said, oh, I've been asked to ask. And so this pressure's then mm. building up. You get a letter on the mat with a court summons. Yes. And you've yes, been, how many after. times have you been to court now, Sarah, to discuss this? Um, three times. And the, the judge has argued, looking at um, some of the notes from the case, because this isn't over and you're still under pressure. And if we take yeah. the worst case scenario, you could end up, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, am I to say that you could end up going to prison if the state decides that Tom should have the vaccine and you say no? Um, so I hadn't realised this. There had been some, some threats. Um, previous but not that severe. Um, I found that out just before I went into my court case in February this year. Right. Um, and the, the, you've spent um, £25,000 of your own life savings on this, uh -huh. fighting it. Um, the judge has yeah. said that Tom is what he would consider to be in an at-risk group due to his disabilities. The judge says the evidence is that the vaccines do give protection against serious illness and death. As you say, he's already had COVID twice, your son. And the judge said a further yeah. factor is that Tom may have made an altruistic decision to receive the vaccine to protect the community at large. This isn't over for you, is it? And what kind of toll has it taken on you? Oh, gosh. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when I start talking about my emotional feelings, I get upset. In fact, okay. I get upset every day. Yeah. About it. Because so. this is somebody that you've, you've cared for tirelessly for 23 years since he was a very poorly baby. Mm. And you've always done what's right for him. And you must feel in your mind if the risk of having this drug could end his life, which is so precious to you. Well, absolutely. I mean, no mother would ever risk their own child's life, you know, if it wasn't necessary. As you say, he's had COVID twice. He dealt, you know, he, he had the same symptoms of, as myself. We had it together and we both recovered in the same you know, so he has natural immunity. He's had a blood test to prove that as well. And uh, so this what, is all known back to us. There'll be, there'll be people watching this, Sarah, just saying this, like, it can't be true. Like, in 2024, mm. there must be more to this. The state no. wouldn't be wishing to take the role of the parents in this way. What, how do you explain well, I, it? I, 
Well, I can't believe it myself, to be honest. But um, apparently once um, uh, you become 18 and you can't uh, decide for yourself, then that's exactly what the courts can do. They take the decision now to the parents' hands um, and make the decisions for them. Do you have any idea if you're alone in this? In fact, since I put on social media that I was interviewing you, mm -hmm. I've been contacted by mothers in exactly the same position oh. as you. And I would love to connect right. you. Um, but as far as you know, you're, you're one of very few. Um, I know a few. I know a few. There are about four or five uh, that I'm in touch with. Um, there are many families that have, have gone through what I have. Um, it would be interesting to know how many exactly. Um, yeah. And if, if you look at the people who are driving this action against you, I don't want you to name names yeah. necessarily, but what kind of roles are they in? Is it, is it still the GP? Is it social services? Who is behind the pressure? Um, I think, you see, at this point, um, my, I have changed GPs. And my GP now, um, with the evidence from the professor, has actually refused to vaccinate him. Mm. Um, so it isn't coming from his GP at this point in time. It's coming from my son's uh, ALR, which is the accredited legal representative, who the ICB actually chose right. to represent my son. And it's coming from the ICB themselves. And the ICB, sorry, just what, who are the ICB? What does that acronym stand the for? I the ICB, the Integrated Care Board. Right, I see. And these, these, the, the, but this is the board that initially took me to court. And if they win this, this case, and if the judge deems that Tom has to be uh, injected, how, how does that work? Do they literally hold him down? Um, well, I've always said that he um, was never to be vaccinated in the home because my, the home is our, our sacred place. Mm. It's a loving, safe place. Um, it's always been a happy place. Um, and, you know, know. so... Um, but the, it has been said that the ALR would possibly organise somebody to come and collect him from the home, take him away, inject him and bring him back to me. And you yeah. must... A stranger take him away in a car, you know, that uh, goes against everything, you know. And you, uh, must just feel, you must just feel like sweeping him up on an aeroplane and just going and just escaping, <laughs> you know. I, cause I, know. I, I mean, I'm, no. it's making me cry talking to you because you walk over hot coals mm. to keep your kids safe. Yes, yeah, of course you do, of course you do. You know, I'm so close because um, I'm a single parent and I, love it. I just love him so much, mm. you know. And it's, it's impossible um, for you to know what he understands, of course, because he has the, the mental age of a toddler at 24. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He, fortunately, he has no idea what's going on. And I'm so, so glad of that, you know. And you've yeah. got, um, and we said it's expensive. You spent your life savings on defending yourself in court and Tom. Yes. Um, you've got yeah. a fundraising site. And I have no doubt that our viewers and listeners would want to help you. Um, what, what's, where can they find the place to give you some support, Sarah? Um. Yes, there is. Um, my solicitor set this up. It's um, if you type in forced vaccinations on our loved ones, um, that should take you to the crowd justice page. Okay. Um, and within that, there's a lot more um, about the case. And, okay. uh, there's a, a video as well <clears throat> um, with updates, you know. Yeah. So you've set up a crowd justice page. Uh, yes. to to raise uh, the money to to help you in this situation. Um, it's incredibly complicated and we wish you all the best. And I, I applaud your bravery uh, for talking about it because I think it raises really important issues about the role of the parents 
and the role of the states and who ultimately has control of our children. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. Extraordinary. Right. You have been watching uh, Neil Oliver's show on GB News with me, Bev Turner. Thank you very much for watching. The great man himself will be back from next week. Uh, so don't worry about that. I will see you on Britain's Newsroom Monday morning, 9.30. See you then.